My documentary was never a documentary. All it was was a story that I wanted to tell. Almost three years ago, I met a person who in almost every single way was different than me. I went out one evening to have a beer at the Dunright Inn. That was my local bar at the time. It's on Queen Street West in Toronto, in the area of Trinity Bowitz Park. In the, in the three years that has passed, that area has been developed like crazy. It's been changed. The man that I met that night was not, however, a part of this development. He was and is different than anyone that I expected to have a beer with. Just to me, that night, he seemed like a work of fiction. He is a character now, and his name is Mad Dog. He is the actor in what you're currently watching. You're watching us on the night we first met. He's 56 years old, or so he tells me. And he talks to me about Toronto in the late 1960s, when he was cool, when he was around the same age as me. And the important fact is that he still feels as if he is the same age. He tells me that he used to ride around on a motorcycle and cause shit when he was young. I sense bitterness in his voice. And I notice that he's talking about the past like it was the very recent. And I think to myself, this, this man seems as though he hasn't really lived since then. Mad Dog begins telling me things that are more personal than things that are usually shared with a complete stranger. He tells me he has a younger sister, and they are both from the East Coast originally, but moved to Toronto in their late teens. Then he said that when he did his time, it was on the East Coast. And I ask him what he did his time for. Was it anything interesting? <laughs> he tells me that I'm about to hear a long story, but he'll give me the short version, because he didn't want to take all night. He told me that the peace and love and all that of the late 60s wasn't really his style. It was more about drinking and drugs and fucking shit up. He tells me that he formed a biker gang and caused lots of trouble. He told me that his sister was into partying up as well. She was getting herself into trouble too. He really wanted to take care of and nurture her. She ended up getting into too much trouble one night. He wasn't very specific about how but she was raped by two men. Mad Dog told me that he had never been so furious about anything. He said that he was so angry that he hunted these men down and killed them both. All of a sudden, I was having beers with a murderer, sitting beside him in my local bar, and I wasn't afraid. I wanted to hear more. But that was the exact moment that everything changed, because I said that we should make it into a film. <laughs> I asked him if he had ever written anything about it, or as anyone else. He said he had written poetry during his 25-year jail sentence. Obviously someone who kills people goes to jail, but I really thought it would be for the rest of their life. There's no wonder why he still felt and acted like he was in his 20s. The way he acted, it's hard to explain, other than saying it was if he had lost those years of his life. If you know me, then you would know that of course I would blow everything out of proportion. By the end of that evening, both Mad Dog and myself were excited about making a documentary. I can sum up the next two and a half years that followed very briefly. We had many, many meetings where I would talk a completely irrelevant to the story that I wanted to tell in my film. I took notes that somehow were lost in the couple of moves to new apartments that I made during those years. And I became obsessed with Mad Dog telling me the exact word-for-word -word story that he told me the night we met. It's never gonna happen. He's never gonna tell me what I want to hear. And a couple of weeks ago, the last time I saw him, 
we were on our 15th scheduled meeting. That was canceled. And then I realized that for the previous two months, in all my ridiculous persistence, he had dropped out of documentary land. And I was far too absorbed in my own vision. I finally realized when he told me to my face that he no longer wanted to work with me. Okay, I think I wear blinders sometimes. I will never admit defeat. Not to him, not to anyone. What I do is I go to Texas. Around the same time as the documentary fell apart, the same week, a really close friend of mine named Callie told me about the fact that she was getting paid to pick up some parts from a Mack truck company in Houston. She was taking a trip driving down in a yellow van and driving back in the span of a week. On our journey, Texas bound. Where in Texas are we going? Houston. Houston. I thought it was Austin. No. See, I don't even fucking know. Uh, I wish we were going to Austin. I don't think we have to go to Laredo anymore. Dude, you know what's crazy? So I talked to Squillis too. Yeah. And uh, said, so, you know, what are you doing this weekend? Maybe Suzanne and I will drop by, you know, yada, yada. He's like, are you sure? It's like Mardi Gras weekend. Like Mardi Gras. We're going to Mardi, Mardi Gras. Gras. <laughs> I really wanted to get out of here. And I knew that along the road, from Toronto to Houston, there were a few stops that we could make. You see, Callie and I were both part of this internet community on IRC called ASCIIPRON. We are in America! I was Kate Palmer calling to say, where are you? Where are you here yet? <laughs> First stop. Ohio, <laughs> land of the uh... I'm driving way too fucking fast! It's a rush going across the U.S. border and actually uh, flirting with the uh, I started doing the whole <laughs> chat thing a couple of years ago, but um, I had only been getting it into it really recently. I had this, what I thought of as a different identity. The identity of Susanette who, um, I guess in my opinion, could do no wrong. <laughs> I, uh, I could sort of separate my own life from, from that life and take this trip as the opposite, I guess I thought. That's the way I left. I mean, that's what I had in my head when I was going. Along the way, I learned to think a little bit differently. The IRC channel that we're on, ASCIIPRON, was formed by Mr. Bonnie and 65535 in 1998. ASCII art is an art form which uses the American Standard Code for Information Interchange to make art. Characters are crudely organized to form drawings and pictures. And prawn is simply internet slang for porn.
We have a picture you of Bonnie not have it and out. Mr. Bonnie on the dashboard Hi, of the car for this trip. When we came back from the trip, we realized that part of the reason that we wanted to meet Drew in Oklahoma was so that we could size him up and see if he was good enough for Bonnie to meet or sane enough. I met Drew Corlett on IRC when he was 15 years old, back in the downlet days when his nick was Ectopia. Things were pretty different then, but I was kind of fascinated by his nihilism, his collection of empty Robitussin bottles, the way he always knew exactly how to treat anyone, how to flatter or insult. It was a vague thought, but I remember how sad it was that he was so young and far away, in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, how I would never ever meet him. Over four years he never went away. He DCC'd me pictures of himself, his cock, the plants he grew, his house. Somehow during that time I started to answer more of his queries. When I got a cubicle job looking out on a drab green and pink building, I started to rely on him more. He said this was not me. He told me he could make me feel like I was in a dream. When he told me to go masturbate in the bathroom, I did it, and I came out to the office again, nestled in our private joke. I believed him. It wasn't me. He sent me gifts and letters. We started talking on the phone for hours. A lot of the time, he was tripping on mescaline or datura. His duality was the truth, because I feel like there's no truth in me at all. I'm beautiful and radiant, a fat bitch full of shit. He's my internet boyfriend, a tweaked out perverted fucking loser who keeps a jar of his own shit in his closet. Both of us are nothing. It's a relief not to have to look inside for a truth that has never been there. And once we get these parts and start heading home, it will be mission accomplished. Callie's mission, my, my fun. We're in the Mac truck lot. Suzanne. And you're Tom, right? Okay. Yeah. Unless you wore someone else's shirt today. <laughs> Look, Suzanne wore her Mac hat. Oh, you go, girl. Very okay. <laughs> All right. She's uh, like, we're going down to Mac. Pull out my hat. <laughs> Whip your hat out. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. I'm just, I'm just a passenger on this journey. I don't have a Mac hat. And this is the hand house. There you go. Oh, Callie. Yeah. Let's see if we. A lot of us from ASCII Prana are from Toronto and hang out a lot together. We've all met face to face and some of the people I, I knew long before I talked to them online. And a lot of the, the other people live in the States and Europe and we've always been curious to meet them. Last summer Willis came He's from New Orleans. He came to visit us and helped us with our party, IRQ. And on this trip, Callie and I are going to visit him in New Orleans. Our trip ended in uh, New Orleans, in Mardi Gras. By that time, I had realized that the internet identity, Susan it was not its own identity. All it was, was a nick on a channel. On an IRC channel. A nickname, not an identity.